This video is on carbon-13 to proton one-bond correlation spectroscopy methods. This is actually covered in Chapter 5 of the textbook. However, I am including it in the introductory module on carbon-13 NMR because of the value of this method in linking directly carbon-13 nuclei with covalently bonded protons. The classical method for doing this was called HETCOR for heteronuclear correlation. This experiment was a C13 NMR experiment with coupling for protons. However, this experiment is rarely used today because it has all of the limitations associated with, with the poor sensitivity of carbon-13 for signal acquisition. The method that is used most widely today is HMQC. This is a proton in a Mars spectrum, which detects carbon-13 nuclei covalently bonded to the protons that are detected. This has the advantage of the high sensitivity of the proton to the NMR phenomenon for signal acquisition and is limited only by the relatively low natural abundance of carbon-13 of 1%. However, the HMQC experiment does not require any more time than a normal carbon-13 NMR experiment. On occasion, the HSQC is used, particularly with macromolecules. HMQC and HSQC for the small molecule chemist give very similar information. I show a few spectra from the textbook that exemplify the power and the utility of the HMQC experiment. This is a two-dimensional plot with proton NMR on one axis and carbon-13 plotted on the other axis. I will label the 18 protons and the 10 carbons as described earlier. We'll start at the deshielded end of the spectrum. And so for proton A, which is the doublet of doublets, this shows that this correlates with carbon B. Now where this becomes really valuable is for this next group where there are actually four protons that are very close together in chemical shift. B is resolved, but C, D, and E are overlapping. The HMQC reveals that B correlates with carbon D. It turns out that carbon D is bonded to two protons. That could be demonstrated by a separate depth experiment, but we see in the HMQC that there is another proton that is correlating at the same position. And that appears to be proton D, which is overlapping with C and E. We can then look at protons C and E, and it is now apparent that those are correlated with carbon C. This carbon is also bonded to two protons. Continuing our analysis, proton F, which is between three and a half and four parts per million, correlates with carbon E which is at about 70 parts per million. Then, 
we analyze G and H, and those are both bonded to the same carbon, G. The couplings on protons G and H are leaning in toward each other, so that can be a pretty good indication that those protons are coupled. But the HMQC shows that these protons are on the same carbon. As we continue with this analysis, there are two hydrogens that overlap, I and J, and these protons correlate to carbon H. However, if we have done a depth experiment, we know that H is a methine, meaning a carbon that is bonded to only one proton. Therefore, the second proton might be attached to the oxygen, especially if we have evidence from infrared spectroscopy that the compound contains an alcohol. Continuing with the analysis, K and L correlate with carbon F. Note that the trend in the proton chemical shifts is not exactly following the trend in the carbon chemical shifts. That might not have been obvious if we were simply having to make guesses without the HMQC correlation data. And then finally, we have six hydrogens at about one part per million. If you've read earlier in the textbook, you'll see that it's 600 megahertz or by adding some benzene to the solvent mixture, you can distinguish two diastereotopic methyl groups. But in this case, these look like a six hydrogen apparent triplet at 300 megahertz. However, we can tell that by correlation spectroscopy that the left side and the right side of this triplet are correlating with different carbon atoms. If we look at the inset, which is simply an expansion, which the operator can easily do, it is apparent that M3 is a doublet that correlates with carbon I, and then N3 is another doublet that correlates with carbon J. We can then present this data in a column format. In one column, we'll have the carbon-13 peaks. In the other column, we'll have the proton peaks. In a publication, we will report chemical shifts in parts per million, but for the purpose of this exercise, we'll simply use the uppercase Roman letters for carbon and lowercase letters for proton. And these line up in the following way. HMQC does not alone allow us to make all of the structural assignments that are shown in this picture. Those came from HMQC in combination with other two-dimensional methods. But in my opinion, it is useful to first know which protons are attached to which carbons before we use other two-dimensional methods such as proton-proton cozy. This is the HMQC spectrum of caryophylline oxide, which has 15 carbons and 24 protons. This compound gives quite a bit of complexity and overlap in the proton spectrum. And in the carbon spectrum, there are also a few peaks that are fairly close together.
although those can be distinguished upon an expansion. In combination with a depth study, we can actually link all of the protons, including those that are buried in multiplets, with individual carbons. I won't take the time to work through this in the video, but will encourage you to take some time with this from the textbook spectrum. And this is figure 5.17. What I recommend doing is to print out this spectrum on a piece of paper and then use a ruler or a straight edge to make sure that you're lining up all of the proton peaks with the carbon peaks and identifying where there are correlations. That becomes particularly important in areas where you have a lot of overlap between the carbon peaks or between the proton peaks. For practice, for at least one of these 2D HMQC spectra from the textbook, I recommend creating a table of carbon-13 linked to proton using uppercase and lowercase letters. This is particularly valuable when your sample contains a mixture. And for the carbohydrate disaccharide lactose, the mixture is a slowly equilibrating mixture of anomers. These are diastereomers at the reducing terminus of the disaccharide. The spectrum is slightly simplified by using D2O as the solvent, and so all of the hydroxylated groups exchange with deuterium, making them functionally invisible in the NMR spectrum. However, this still leaves us with seven hydrogens on each of the two carbohydrate rings. So there are 14 individual proton peaks. Furthermore, as a mixture of diastereomers, there is some doubling of many of these peaks. The peaks that are furthest downfield are actually the ones that are easier to assign. There are these peaks that are between 4 and 5.5 parts per million. The peak that is labeled as alpha-1 is this equatorial hydrogen, and so it is deshielded consistent with what we've already studied for equatorial hydrogens on six-membered rings. The coupling constant is also relatively small due to a dihedral angle that is approaching 60 degrees. For the beta anomer, the hydrogen is axial and therefore it is shielded and has a larger coupling constant due to the trans diaxial arrangement of the hydrogens on adjacent carbons. For the other anomeric hydrogen, for both diastereomers, this hydrogen is axial, and so it is shielded, it has a relatively large coupling constant, and the two chemical shifts for the two diastereomers happen to be at the exact same frequency in the NMR spectrum, which is indicative of the distance from this chiral center to the chiral center where there is a difference. If we look at the carbon-13 spectrum, although lactose has 12 carbons, we see that there are actually 18 carbon resonances in the NMR spectrum. However, this is somewhat simplified 
by the depth spectra in that the methylene groups at carbon 6 of each of the carbohydrates are clearly distinguished from the rest of these peaks. The peaks that are furthest downfield happen to be the anomeric peaks at carbon 1 of both of the carbohydrates. Beyond these assignments, the carbon-13 spectrum alone is not too helpful, but in an HMQC spectrum, we can now begin to make some sense through these correlations. For example, we can observe the correlation of the carbon alpha-1 with the corresponding proton, the carbon of beta-1 with the corresponding proton, and likewise for the other anomeric carbon, G1, it's what it's labeled, we can see the proton signal. Fortunately, all of the carbon peaks are resolved, and so we can use that to differentiate between overlapping peaks in the proton spectra by looking at these correlations. Ultimately, all of the assignments that are given in the spectrum in figure 523 came from applying multiple two-dimensional techniques. However, the key to this is to be able to assign specific proton resonances to specific carbons. The last example that I show in this video is for a tetrapeptide. This HMQC spectrum shows only the range in the proton spectrum from 4.5 to 1 ppm. There are NH peaks that are part of the amide functional groups that are well beyond this at greater than eight parts per million, consistent with the hydrogen bonding of the amides. But for this inset, we can link specific carbons, which are all resolved in this tetrapeptide with overlapping proton peaks, including once again, diastereotopic methyl groups that are associated with valine.